Hi, good morning, friends. I'm so sorry that I'm not with you this morning, or Hannah either. I'm afraid we came home from holiday with COVID. We're both feeling still quite rough. Um, I'm hoping that I'll be able to get through this sermon without coming out in a hot or cold sweat or <coughs> coughing too much. Um, so I am really sorry, and I hope you're having a blessed time um, at church. So I'm here and I really want to give the, the message that God has placed on my heart to you this morning. So this August, our sermon series has been looking at the fruit of the Spirit. We haven't been going through each attribute listed in Galatians 5 individually or in detail, but rather we're focusing on leaning into Christ and displaying his nature in our lives. So you might remember in week one, we looked at how fruit grows and we matched up Galatians 5 with John 15 and what it is to be the branch in the vine. <clears throat> week two, I focused in on one of the biggest challenges in our culture, which is anxiety and stress. And we looked at how the fruit of the spirit can help us with that. Last week, Andrew preached a great message on walking in step with the Spirit and allowing him to move in us and through us. And all of these messages are now online, so do please visit our YouTube channel to catch up on them. And so this morning, I'm coming again, wanting to look at the invitation that Jesus gives us, an invitation that he gives that we as a culture, as a society, as an individuals, really, really need to hear and to look at how that ties in with the fruit of the spirit that's alive and growing in us. And so hopefully you've got your Bibles with you and I'd like you to turn to Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. And it says this, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now I'm wondering, can you relate to this verse? I'm going to be honest with you, I had two naps yesterday. I'm feeling really exhausted. I'm so tired. <clears throat> with these flu-like symptoms. But I'm thinking kind of generally, generally in life at the moment, can you relate to that? Are you feeling weary? Are you feeling exhausted? Are you feeling this heavy burden that Jesus speaks about? To be honest with you, as, as I go around chatting with people, I come across this every, all the time, every day. I ask people, how are you? And the response is, I'm so tired. I'm so tired. Things are so hard or so difficult. I'm really struggling with that or there's just so much on and it feels like I'm being stretched all the time or I can't manage this and that. And this is frequently what I, what I hear. And for some people, you're tired, you're overwhelmed with difficulties because of a particular situation because of the circumstances that you're in, just seem, wow, this is so heavy. Wow, this is so busy. Wow, this is so much. Others of you, your weariness, your exhaustion is coming from a place of pain. You're hurting and you're tired. You're hurting and hurting is exhausting. You know, aching all over or acute pain, aching in a particular place, whether that's physical or, or emotional or mental is really, really tiring. And a lot of people are feeling like that. It's, I'm just exhausted. For others, they're feeling weighed down with the emotions of guilt and shame. Now that might be because of something that they have done, or it might be because of something that has happened to them. And yet they're carrying that guilt that shame, it's this heavy burden, it's this wearying, it's on them all the time. They think about it, it goes over and over in their mind, in their brain, they can't get rid of it. 
and these emotions can bring us down. Others, actually, the reason you're tired is because you're bored. You're bored, you haven't got anything to do. You haven't found what sets you alight yet. You just feel like you're treading water, doing the same thing over and over. Maybe, maybe the word that comes to mind is tiresome. Tiresome, weary, tiresome, because it's just the same all the time. Now, if you were here in first century Israel at Jesus's time, the people would be able to relate to this verse. They were living under the occupation of the Romans, which made really heavy demands on them. Okay, we're talking physical, practical demands. They didn't have their freedom of their own religion. They had to worship in a certain way, mostly, as long as they didn't, you know, they could still worship God as long as they recognised Caesar as well. They had to pay taxes. There were demands on them. They were very much repressed and oppressed in what they could do in their circumstances. Added to this were all the religious laws of the day that the leaders of the synagogue, that the Pharisees, that the Sadducees put upon them. People were exhausted, exhausted at the hoops that they had to jump through to obey them all. Life was really, really difficult. And they often, you know, didn't, didn't know how they could match up, that they could live up to what they were doing. They were exhausted. And we see in this verse that Jesus begins with an invitation. He offers an invitation and he says, if you're feeling like this, if you are weary and exhausted, then he says, come to me. Please come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Come to me. It can only be found in him. What can only be found in him? The way, the truth and the life. The thief comes to steal, kill and destroy, but he has come that we may have life in all its fullness. It's a verse I repeat again and again because this is the gospel. This is what God has got for us. So Jesus begins with an invitation. And he says, if you're feeling like this today, will you come to me? Come and be with me. Come hear me. And then number two, he gives a promise. He says, I will give you rest. I will give you rest. He will lift that weariness, that heaviness, that burdens from us. For some of us, that means that our situation is going to change. It means that God is going to shift things around in the circumstances that you find yourself in. And those will alter and that will lift this, this burden, this weight off of us. For some of us, that means that actually he wants to deal with that guilt and shame that we are carrying. Whatever that might be, for whatever reason, but that guilt and shame that we are feeling, that is never of the Lord. And he promises you that he wants to deal with that. He wants to forgive. He wants to redeem. He wants to reassure you of your love, of his love. He wants to say you are free from any of those burdens. You are free from those chains of guilt and shame because that is not how he wants you to live. And perhaps that's what you need today. Perhaps that will lift this feeling of weariness and burden off you. You can be free today. Reach out to him in faith and ask him for that freedom. Or if this is something that you're struggling with and struggling with alone, please don't do that. Do contact me. I, I will be recovered from this COVID this next week. So please do contact me and I would love to meet up with you. We can pray together, we can seek God's scripture together and he will bring that freedom that he wants to offer you because you're not supposed to live like that. <clears throat> For others, <clears throat> excuse me, the outward circumstances, no, they're not going to change. They honestly won't. Jesus actually didn't come and overthrow the Romans, okay? He didn't do that. That's what the people of Israel were expecting that he was going to set them free from Roman rule. He said, no, no, those circumstances aren't going to change. But what I'm going to do is change something in you. 
Change something in you so that you have got the spiritual, emotional, and mental strength that you need to handle what it is that you're facing so that you can live life to the full, even in your circumstances. Some of you need to hear that today. And for some of you, that's what God is saying. I'm going to renew your heart so that you're different in the circumstances. And there are those who are bored, who are bored and need to ask God for renewal of their passion and their purpose. That might require some seeking, some praying, some maybe fasting, maybe going on a route of saying, God, what is it that you've got for me? I can't live like this anymore. I am weary and tired because I've got nothing to do. Please, God, will you speak to me and ignite my passion and ignite what it is that you've got for me? Because the truth is he's got something for all of us. How do I know that? Well, because in this passage, the third aspect, so we've got the invitation, come to me, the promise, I will give you rest. And then number three, there is the command. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now, we're not here talking about the yoke of an egg. OK, we are, of course, talking about the yoke that a pair of oxen would wear over their necks in a field to together pull a plow. Or maybe they'd be walking along a road pulling a cart. OK, along a, that's the kind of yoke that we're talking about. I'm going to put a picture up here so you can see it. That's the kind of yoke. And, and the thing is, there is no such thing as a yokeless life. This is what we've been looking at in Galatians 5. So if you want to just flip over to Galatians 5, again in your Bibles, you will see this. You will see that Jesus talks about the way that we walk. And he says, you are to walk by the Spirit. This is, this is verse 16, by the way. Walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law of the flesh. And so what, what it happens is that wherever we are, whenever in our lives, we are yoked and that might be yoked to the things that are not of God or we can be yoked to Jesus. We can be yoked to the things that are of God and here it says in Galatians 5 that we are to walk with the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such thing, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And so we've got here this keeping in step with the Spirit, which is the same as being yoked to Jesus. It's exactly the same. And so in this passage in Matthew 11, this is what Jesus is saying. Do you want rest? Do you want to know what it is not to be heavy burdened? Come be yoked to me. Now, Jesus knew what he was talking about. He was a carpenter, so he would have known how to make yokes, yokes that fit and fit well. And the extraordinary part of this metaphor, the truth in here, is that it is Jesus who is yoked with us. He is in that yoke side by side, like these two cattle in the picture. This is Jesus and us. Jesus and me. He shares the load. He doesn't make it make us carry it on our own. He is right there before us. Have you ever picked up a really heavy shopping bag, so heavy that you couldn't manage it, and then you called over 
in my case, one of my daughters, Hannah, get over here. You know, I need you to help me. And instead of me carrying the whole bag, I take one handle and she takes the other and together we carry it and it's light and we can do it. We can manage the burden. She's one side, I'm this side and we're carrying it together. And that is what Jesus is talking about. That is what this yoke is for. We are walking together, carrying this burden, pulling it together. And it's not difficult. The yoke fits. We are side by side, shoulder to shoulder. He's there partnering with us, us partnering with him. We are connected, going the same way. It is that wonderful picture of I am always with you. I will never leave you. And so we are instructed by Jesus to walk in step with him, in step with the spirit. Together in this yoke, and fascinatingly, it says here, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now, I love this. Maybe it's because I love learning. You know, I love studying. I even actually quite like writing essays, but I love reading. I love studying. I love learning. And one of the things I actually love about getting older is how much I've learned. Yeah, and I've forgotten it as well because my brain <coughs> is a bit like a sieve and it all runs out again. But I actually love the fact that I've learned so much. I've learned so much over life and I can keep learning. And that is fantastic. And we are called to continually be learning. You know, if you have stopped learning, then there's something wrong. And truthfully, you're missing out because all of us should constantly <coughs> be learning learning more about Jesus, learning more about his person, his purpose for us personally. And we should particularly be learning how to live and rest in him. So just want you to, to turn to the person sitting next to you. I hope this works on video. Turn to the person sitting next to you and ask them, have they learned how to walk and rest in Jesus? Ask, them, you ask your neighbour that. Okay, I don't know how long this will take. You might need to pause this till everybody's stopped talking and then start it again. Okay, so have they, have they learned how to rest and in Jesus? Is that part of this yoke? Part of this yoke. Now I'm quite fascinated by this. So I'm yoked together. I'm step by step with Jesus and I've got to learn. What is it? What is it that I'm learning? How do I discover this life and this rest in Jesus? Say so that together we're yoked and I am not weary and overburdened, but instead can be walking in the fruit of the spirit, the fullness of all those wonderful Adjectives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. How can I do that? I love the verse that Jeremiah gives, 616. Jeremiah says this, stand at the crossroads and ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your soul. We're talking about that rest that we need, the rest for our souls, the inner part of us, that bit that is, is, is eternal, that bit that hungers for God, that bit that makes up us even more than our bodies and looks and character does, our very souls. And Jeremiah tells us, you find that, you find those ways and you find that rest for your soul. You find what your inner person really needs by asking for the ancient paths, looking at where do I go to find this? It will be different from each one of us. But one of the things that is for everybody and the most ancient path and the ancient way to find rest for our soul is to start with what God established right at the very beginning of creation. When he said, you work for six days and you rest on the seventh. That rest on the seventh, so vital for our bodies and our souls. 
So vital to have a Sabbath day of rest. It's not the same as our modern weekend off work, okay? A Sabbath rest is a time to slow right down and do what is needed to refocus our soul on God. The Jewish Sabbath or Shabbat was actually a 25 hour period beginning on Friday evening with a family meal of prayers, blessings over the various members of the family and thanksgiving. And you ate together, you would have that time of blessing, of scripture reading, thanksgiving, and then just enjoy being together. That would be followed by the next 24 hours of sleep and rest, a Sabbath day, Saturday in this case, where there'd be worship in the synagogue together with other members of your Jewish family, your faith, and you wouldn't work all day, but you would allow the body and the mind and soul to recover in the presence of the Lord. Okay. It wasn't like our weekends are, which are days to catch up on the shopping, to make sure all the laundry is done, to go off to those family parties, to fit in sports club after sports club. Now, please don't think that I'm saying those things are wrong. They are not. But that's not a day of rest for our soul. A day of rest for our soul is a day that is set apart, that is called to be holy unto the Lord. And if you are exhausted, well, then quite frankly, whatever you're doing now isn't working for you. I would like to encourage you. Why don't you experiment? Take a month of intentionally keeping a Sabbath each week. Intentionally keeping a Sabbath. Actually go to your diary and cross out that one day that you are going to keep Sabbath. A Sabbath rest and see how that works for you. A Sabbath rest of rest for your body and for your soul of reconnecting with the Lord. See what a difference that makes to your life. Does that help you with your weariness, with your tiredness, with your exhaustion? Does that bring you rest? It might be as well that you might want to explore the other ancient ways that will minister to your soul. For Hannah and I, we've discovered that it includes pilgrimage, okay, and walks through nature with God. That ministers to us. That gives us rest, rest for our soul, rest for our mind. We always feel refreshed, less burdened, less weary when we're out walking in Broxbourne Woods or taking a pilgrimage. So experiment, learn. This is the learning bit. Learn what it is that you need to find rest for your souls, to be that part of that yoke and what God has got for you. How do you walk step by in step with the Spirit that you can be full of the gifts of the Spirit? Let's go back to our verses here in Matthew 11. So we've had the invitation, come. We've had the promise, I will give you rest. We've had the instruction, take my yoke upon, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And now we've got this really, really beautiful reassurance of why it works. Because Jesus says, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Gentle and humble in heart. You know, I, I think this is the only place in the gospel where Jesus ever actually refers to his own heart or feelings. And I think it's fascinating here that he, he mentions an attribute that is a fruit of the Spirit. He is gentle. He is gentle and we can trust him in this because he is gentle. Now I love this idea of gentleness. I love this fruit. It's so wonderful because gentleness is strength and power that's under control. Gentleness is not weakness. It was often um, in, in, in previous times, in past times, linked with the word meek, meekness, which became kind of associated with being weak or, um, or pathetic. Whereas in actual fact, it's not. Weak, meekness and gentleness does not mean being weak. <clears throat> gentleness is actually strength and power that's under control. 
It means that you are strong, but not harsh. That your strength and power are used in such a way that it cares for and loves others. Isaiah 40 verse 11 talks about God in this way of being gentle. 40, Isaiah 40 verse 11 says this, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers his lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who've had young. Isn't that beautiful? This idea again, this picture of God being the good shepherd who gathers his lambs up, who holds them close to him, who leads those who've got young gently, slowly, at a pace that they can go with care and compassion. Is this because he is a weak shepherd? No. In fact, the very verse before this, Isaiah 40 verse 10 says, see the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. And then it says, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have yet have young. We're looking here at God in his full strength and his gentleness. And together, together they come. And that's what he promises to give to us. <clears throat> One of my earliest childhood memories is being outside with my dad in a thunderstorm. I was very young. I mean, I, a very small, like preschool child. And um, we were out. It was night. It was dark. And the crashes were so loud, so loud. We were soaked through with rain. And I began to get frightened. And I was there with my dad. And I remember this so vividly that my dad told me I didn't need to be afraid. He held my hand tight as we walked and he told me that he always imagined thunder to be God moving the furniture around in heaven. That bang, that one there, that was a dining room table being moved across the floor. <gasps> Did you hear that massive crash? That's a piano being dropped down the stairs by the angels. You know, my dad in all of this, he wasn't afraid. He loved thunderstorms. He enjoyed getting wet. He enjoyed the dark. Yeah, that's where I get it from. Okay, because I was definitely a daddy's girl. So I get it all from him, you know, and he knew there was nothing to be afraid. He had a strength in that thunderstorm that I, as a tiny child, did not have. And yet... He showed me that strength, not by reprimanding me. Don't be silly, nothing to be afraid of. But in such a wonderful, gentle, fatherly way, saying, Bethany, there's nothing to be afraid of. Yeah, it's just the crashes. I picture it as furniture being moved around in heaven. And that is still not the kind of furniture being moved around in heaven. But that's still the picture that I hold whenever I face something scary. When I need to lean into God, I actually picture myself holding the hand of my father, my heavenly father, holding his hand when things get too much, putting my hand in his and saying, God, will you be my strength and will you lead me through this hard time? God, I want to take your yoke upon me, the yoke that as we've got here, repeated in the promise, the yoke that is easy and light, the yoke that isn't too much, the yoke that will give me rest for my soul. And this is what he promises. You know, the Romans came placing a crushing load of taxes and Gentile law on the people that they had to fit in with what the empire wanted. The Pharisees came and placed a crushing load of religious rules and laws on the people. Jesus came and said, all you need to do is come to me, love me, walk yoke together with me, and you will find that place where your soul rests. The place where my spirit will fill you up and give you a life of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness and self-control. So as we come to the end of this message, I'd just like to encourage you. Let's take a moment. 
maybe you can close your eyes <clears throat> and picture this saying of Jesus, this saying of Jesus in Matthew 11. I'm going to read it again, but this time from the message version. And as I read it, I want to encourage you to reach out to the Lord, allow his spirit to fill you up and minister to your soul. Are you tired? Worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. May you know this rest this week. The Lord bless you. And I'm going to hand back over to Barbara now to finish the service. Take care, folks.